and I'm very happy to present uh, my recent works on the strongly coupled gauge theories. So let me get started with somewhat lengthy introduction, I have to say. So the question is really, can we solve QCD in some way? And when we get to learn about the protons made of quarks uh, back in a graduate school, and we get told right away that we can never see them, right? So, you know, you get, you get handed a proton and you get told, that, look, they are actually very beautiful, colorful quarks in there, but you can never see them. You can never take them out, but believe me, it's in there. And it sounds like an internet scam. So I actually left a copy of one internet scam actually in my inbox without actually thinking about it. But anyway, it, it does feel like that. But eventually you get also told that, you know, there's actually a name to this, it's called confinement. And so uh, once you see a name in scientific term, then you start taking it a little bit seriously. And, and then you also learn that, that there's something called the negative value function that might actually explain this because the, uh, the forces actually become stronger at long distances. But either way, this is still only suggestive because we don't derive confinement directly from QCD Lagrangian, uh, even now. And there's another puzzle. The proton and pion made of same quarks, but why is pion so much lighter than proton, even nearly massless compared to that? And it sounds all still all very mysterious. Of course, experimentally, we have now beautiful data that really shows that uh, asymptotic freedom is true the strong interactions uh, become really weakly coupled at high energies, like at the Large Hadron Collider. We can use perturbation theory to make our predictions, which agree with the data extremely well. And if you go to low energies and long distances, the forces still do uh, indeed do become strong. But this is still not a uh, proof that uh, the theory confines, and it still doesn't quite explain why the pion is so light. And of course, this is just a plot that shows the pion is indeed much lighter compared to all the other hadrons. And if pion were a little heavier, then of course we know that according to Yukawa originally, that uh, the nuclei are bound together by the exchange of pions. So if pion were heavier, the range of the nuclear force becomes too short to even bind the protons and neutrons together inside the nuclei. So if pions are heavier, then basically the only atom in the whole universe would be hydrogen and nothing else. So it's very important that pions are indeed light enough so that nuclei would bind, and we have this entire periodic table we are made of. Uh, so we start to actually feel better once you understand sort of the theoretical aspect of QCD also better. So at least there's some qualitative picture that makes us feel better about first of all confinement. And this is due to my late colleague, uh, Stanley Mandelstam, who came up with this idea of dual Meitner effect. Namely that if you have a normal superconductor, then what is condensed is the pair of electrons called Cooper pairs. And because of the condensate of the electric charges, then magnetic forces get squeezed into flux tubes, that's a of flux in type two superconductors. And therefore, if you actually just imagine putting one magnetic monopole and one magnetic anti-monopole inside a superconductor, then there's a flux tube made of the magnetic flux uh, stretched between the monopole and the anti-monopole and therefore the potential energy goes linearly with the distance. That's exactly what we want for the confinement. So his idea is that if there is actually condensation of the magnetic monopoles instead, then that would squeeze the electric field into flux tubes. And then the forces between quarks and antiquarks would be actually connected together by the flux of electric forces. And therefore the potential energy grows linearly with the distance. And that led to the idea of string fragmentation in, for example, the A plus C minus data. <clears throat> so that became sort of the hallmark of how we might qualitatively understand the origin of confinement. In the same way, Nambu proposed this idea of chirosymmetry breaking. So basically that, that if you actually take the limit of the quarks being massless in QCD, then QC Lagrangian has a much bigger symmetry of rotating uh, NF number of left-handed quarks independently from NF number of right-handed quarks, and also your barrier number is also a symmetry. If we assume that this large symmetry breaks into the diagonal subgroup of SUNF vector, then that will lead to the number Goldstone bosons, which are massless in the massless limit of the quarks. And we can identify pions as actually the number Goldstone bosons. So that way we can understand why the pions are indeed light. But I still have to emphasize the fact that this is still not 
derived direct from QCD. So if you assume the monopole condensation, you can understand confinement. If you assume karyosymmetry breaking, you understand why pions are like. But you have not derived neither of them, but monopole condensation or karyosymmetry breaking, starting from the QCD Lagrangian and the first principle. Uh, Hitoshi? So for that, sorry? Uh, Hitoshi, um, yes. Uh, clarifying question. Uh, okay. So uh, as far as the uh, um, Carl symmetry breaking is concerned, there exist a slightly non-trivial set of arguments based on anomaly matching, right? That tells you mm -hmm. that the condensate must be formed and therefore Carl symmetry must be broken at, in the IR. So if you put it right. together, I mean, that's as fundamental as it goes, no? Uh, yeah, so, so that's sort of a, a in, in some sense, the argument coming from, uh, from the outside. What, what I'm talking about here is that it's their way of actually really working out the Carl symmetry is broken based on the dynamics of the theory. And that's the question I'm, I'm trying to ask here. I see, yeah. Am I answering your question? Okay. Yeah. okay. So, and, and the people, of course, made progress along this line, especially when people considered actually a supersymmetric version of QCD. So there was a famous uh, uh, papers by uh, Cyborg and Witten, which studied a uh, the Q version of QCD with a large number of supersymmetries, uh, two sets of them. And in this theory, then actually you have a state of field and adjoint representation. So the non-abelian gauge group in general gets broken to a bunch of U1s. So that means that your low energy theory is described in terms of a bunch of electromagnetisms. And they study specifically in the case of SU2 that leads to one electromagnetism. And it turns out that on the theory of grounds, on the space of ground states called moduli space, there are special points where they could convincingly show that there is actually a magnetic monopole from the breaking of SU2 goes U1, which becomes massless at those special places in the space of ground states. And if you break this large number of supersymmetries down to its half, only one set of supersymmetry, by adding a perturbation to the system, then what you do is just minimize the potential and see that monopole field indeed do condense and therefore, they have dynamically demonstrated the monopole condensation does happen in non abelian gauge theories. And in this case, you can further break this remaining supersymmetry down to no supersymmetry at all by introducing the mass of the gauge genomes, then and also see that this monopole condensation survives even with no supersymmetry. So this was a major progress for us to understand that indeed non abelian gauge theories can lead to monopole condensation and therefore can lead to confinement, which would persist even in non supersymmetric theories. But we happen to see in something uh, similar to that uh, in the question of the chiosymmetry breaking, because once you couple this N equals two supersymmetry to, for example, SU3 uh, gauge theory, it turns out that there's a special interaction between left-handed and right-handed quarks to this the scale of an adjoint representation that would break SUNF cross SUNF symmetry already down to an SUNF vectorial. So there is no chiral symmetry to begin with. And we can talk about the, the dynamical breaking of that chiral symmetry. So N equal two is actually not very helpful. And Nati Cyborg afterwards came up with again a series of amazing works. He had actually illustrated how we can understand the dynamics of uh, the, the QCD like theories with less supersymmetry, N equal one. But this theory is also not quite uh, satisfactory for a purpose because the phases of this theory uh, look so unusual. And here's what actually has this covered. Uh, many, many of you do uh, know this already. So if you think of this axis as the number of flavors of quarks coupled to, let's say, SU3QCD or SUNCQCD in general, zero flavor case is the pure Young mills theory, which does confine. And what he has shown is that up to certain number of flavors, in, in particular NC minus one, this theory actually doesn't have a ground state. So it doesn't have a stable theory and it has a runaway behavior where squawk fields start acquiring a very large expectation values all the way going to infinity. So this doesn't look like a normal QCD at all. If you go to one extra flavor, you find, again, the space of many, many ground states. So in this case, rather than having not, no ground state, you have an infinite number of physically inequivalent ground states. In many of them, the baryon number is actually broken. 
So again, it doesn't quite look like what we expect in QCD. If you further go up to another flavor, you find a theory that seems to confine, but doesn't break chiral symmetry. So again, that's not something we kind of expect in QCD either. And if you go to further number of flavors, then you, you, get, you find something that's even more exotic. So the theory does become strong because of the asymptotic freedom at low energies and the quarks get bound into baryons. But those baryons now fragment into smaller pieces called magnetic quarks, which interact with a new gauge theory called the magnetic gauge theory. So again, this looks a very exotic theory uh, in the low energy limit. And beyond this, the theory actually flows to the infrared fixed point, sort of similar to the critical phenomena in condensed matter physics. And further up in a larger number of flavors, then you lose the symptotic freedom and the theory becomes free in infrared. But anyway, so all of these phases the cyborg demonstrated seems to be quite far away from what we expect in the ordinary non supersymmetric QCD. On the other hand, what do we actually know about dynamics of non supersymmetric QCD? If the number of flavors is bigger than 11 half NC, then the theory becomes IR free, the beta function becomes positive again. So here you don't expect any strong dynamics and the theory will be weakly interacting. So the Coulomb theory, uh, uh, the, the, the Coulomb potential between quark and antiquarks. And if you imagine the number of colors is actually very large, let's say 100 or something. And if you're notched below this 11 and a half NC, so for NC is 100, that would be a, a, a 549, say, then you can convincingly show that theory does flow to infrared fixed point called the bank sex fixed point in a perturbative uh, size of the coupling constant. So there you can trust perturbation theory and demonstrate that two loop beta function can vanish at an infrared fixed point. But that can be done, demonstrated only very, very close to this upper edge of this axis. On the other hand, for the low number of flavors like two and three, we know that chiral symmetry has to break primarily from the experimental data. And now, of course, the data also comes from that is QCD simulations. But nonetheless, this is what we uh, understand uh, uh, only in the bottom of this, this uh, axis. And in between, there's still a big question mark. So people speculated that this infrared fixed point behavior may persist to low, lower number of flavors. Some people thought that uh, you may also have a phase where the quarks are not confined, but nonetheless chiral symmetry is broken. And then you may also have all kinds of other possibilities in between, but we haven't quite understood what's going on here. So the main purpose of my talk today is to, uh, to actually convince you that using this result obtained by Natty Cyberg, which doesn't seem to represent the real world in any way, but if, if you introduce a tiny supersymmetry breaking in a very specific way called anomaly mediation, I'd like to actually explain to you in a couple of minutes, then all of these strange behavior of the theories now collapse to something that look familiar, namely all the way from one flavor to three half NC flavors, you do can, you can derive the chiral symmetry breaking as an exact result of these gauge theories. And you can also see that for the larger number of flavors, the theory goes to IR fixed point as well. And then comes a big question, whether you can keep increasing the size of supersymmetry breaking to infinity, where you can connect it to non supersymmetric QCD. And then you have to ask the question, if the mass of the, the supersymmetry breaking becomes comparable to dynamical scale, would there be some kind of phase transition or the phases would continue on continuously. And if you believe that there is no phase transition, and there's an idea called universality class in the statistical physics, that as long as there's no phase transition, then content of the theory for the massless degrees of freedom and behavior of the symmetry breaking uh, would persist uh, continuously. And therefore, you have now understood how chiral symmetry is broken in non supersymmetric QCD by cont continuously connecting from this uh, supersymmetric gauge theory with infinitesimal Susie breaking, which I claim you can solve exactly just by continuation all the way to non supersymmetric limit. So that's the main message I'd like to convey to you today. So if you buy this idea, then we can also make a predictions now, namely that up to the number of flavors of three half NC, you do have chiral symmetry breaking continuously connected 
from this small supersymmetry breaking to large supersymmetry breaking. And in between 3.5 NC to 3 NC, you expect the infrared fixed point. So then you have a definite predictions which can in principle be tested on lattice QCD simulations. So that's the, my main claim. So that's just summarizing the main result. I'm gonna tell you in more detail. Uh, we start with it. Here. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. So you're thinking of perturbing with one particular operator, perturbing mm -hmm. the, the N equal to one supersymmetry with one particular operator. Uh, well, uh, one actually that, set of operators are coming from what is called a normal remediation. Yes. Okay. So, so some fixed set of operators, That's a right. finite set of couplings. Mm -hmm. Okay. And on the way to m equal to infinity, mm -hmm. do you does this uh, manifold pass through a theory which is like massless QCD with completely broken supersymmetry? Yeah. So the, the minute you actually turn on this infinitesimal supersymmetry breaking, you imme immediately add masses to all the squawks and gay genos. So the massless particle content is already that of the massless non-supersymmetry QCD, even though you still have these extra massive particles around. And if you take this uh, SUSY breaking all the way to infinity, then you are decoupling gay genos and squawks. So the particle content is indeed continuously connected to the standard non supersymmetric QCD. Am I answering Thank your you. question? Okay, good. Yes. All right, so the, here's the main result. So we start with this N equal one supersymmetric QCD that have been worked by, uh, by Cyborg, which doesn't seem to look like QCD at all. And there have been many uh, attempts to bring this Cyborg's result to non supersymmetric theories, but many of those attempts didn't have sufficient predictive power to control the approximation. So that didn't lead to sort of exact results. And what I'm going to tell you that the specific way of breaking supersymmetry, which I proposed some time ago called anomaly mediation, is actually uniquely suited for the purpose because of an amazing property called UV insensitivity. And I'm going to tell you more about this also in a couple of minutes. And using this anomaly mediation with infinitesimal size, the theory worked out by Cyberg it immediately collapses to something that looks very reasonable as an expectation in non supersymmetric QCD with basically only three phases one with chirosymmetry breaking, second with infrared fixed point, and third, infrared free theory. So it turns out that this combination of N equal one supersymmetry and anomaly mediation seems to be a great tool to study non supersymmetric dynamics of strongly coupled gauge theories in four dimensions. And now we can derive chirosymmetry breaking from QCD. And in addition, we can apply also the same tool to chiral gauge theories, which are very poorly understood and have not been simulated in a lattice either. And we can make prediction on what these theories do in terms of composite states and how the cement is broken and so on and so forth. So that's what I would like to talk about today. So that was a little lengthy introduction. And next, I'd like to introduce this very specific way of breaking supersymmetry called anomaly mediation, which has this unique property called UV insensitivity. And then while well, having uh, uh, this tool, we apply that to the cyborg results of the SUN N equal one supersymmetric QCD and derive chirosymmetry breaking, uh, you know, really starting from this Lagrangian. Uh, Hidoshi, and I also yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I have uh, one question regarding the chain of thought that you gave in the okay. last uh, slide. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere in the chain of thought is the part that, um, as you take the uh, you know, as you um, go back and forth between the compensator web zero and non zero, uh, mm -hmm. the FPs, um, mm -hmm. the theories are continuously connected. Is right. that an assumption? Is it so obvious that I don't need to think about it again? No, no, you, you should definitely think about it. And I will present the argument why there may not be any phase transitions in between. I, I wouldn't say that I claim that this is actually rock solid result yet, but at least there's an, a, a sort of extension of the usual holomorphy argument, which Cyborg came up with in demonstrating why the supersymmetric gauge theories don't have any phase transitions. And then that you can extend that to also the anomaly mediation. So you'll see if you find the argument convincing or not. I will talk about that actually later on. Okay. Okay. 
Yep, thank you for the question. That's actually definitely something we need to think about. So I explained this on normal mediation, talk about the SUN theory, and I also briefly talk about SON gauge theories, where you have a clear distinction between confinement and screening. And then you can actually even see the monopole condensation happening in this SEO and CQCD once you start with a supersymmetric theory and perturb it with the anomaly media supersymmetry breaking. So that will really be working out the monopole condensation and confinement in a non supersymmetric gauge theory. And having equipped with these tools, I also apply this technique to some chiral gauge theories, one with the anti symmetric tensor field, another with the symmetric tensor field, and demonstrate that we can actually walk through it. And, and again, a prediction on the phase of this theory, which is actually quite different one, one from what people conjectured back in the in, in 80s and 90s. And then I'd like to conclude. So that's the structure for the rest of my talk today. So first things to review what this anomaly media supersymmetry breaking is, which uh, Randall Sundrum and myself together with Jan Judice, Marcus Ludi, and Ricardo Ratazzi uh, uh, proposed back in 98. So what we need is a special way of breaking supersymmetric gauge theories and, and so that they are continuously connected to non-supersymmetric gauge theories. Namely that we need to make sure that both gauginos and squawks acquire mass. For example, you can add mass only to squawks without giving mass to gauginos, but that's not the kind of thing we want. So we need both gaugino mass and squawk mass. But to actually apply supersymmetry breaking, to cyborg's results, where the results are actually expressed in terms of the composite objects like mesons and baryons. Introducing mass to the constituents is not good enough. We need to be able to work out what would happen to these composite objects once you actually turn on the mass for the gauge genome and squawks. So in particular, we really need to know the signs of the, their mass squared to understand whether symmetry is broken or not broken. And therefore, we understand the universality, universality classes of these theories. So we need to have this predictive power. When you turn on the mass of the gauge genome you know, squawks, what would happen to these composite objects like mesons and baryons? And that's where we need to have a very special predictive power. And the kind of things people did try in the past is by turning on the gauge genomes. And if you turn on the gauge genome you know, mass, it does feed into the squawk mass as well from the one loop effects. So in that sense, you can smoothly connect that to the theory with non supersymmetric QCD. And people hoped that there's a special way of introducing gauge genome mass in this supersymmetric multiplet, which comes together with a gauge coupling constant. So once you actually know this combination, you may be able to have some predictive power on how exactly the gauge genome mass would enter non perturbative dynamics. In some cases, it does turn out to be true. So if you're looking at the pure Young Mills theory, then this way of introducing supersymmetry breaking turns out to be predictive enough because you actually don't have any massless composite in this theory. The theory is gap. And the only thing you need to work out is the vacuum structure. But the minute you do this and trying to apply with this theory to the theory with extra quark flavors, then you need to understand what would happen to, for example, the meson or baryons. And, and make a prediction on what the mass of these meson fields are now that the composite, they are composite that include, for example, constituent squawks in it, which is massive. And you can do some kind of the EFT kind of analysis to write down various operators, but you don't have a power of predicting their signs. Then you don't know the mass of the meson mass squares. Then you can predict whether meson condenses or not condenses and then you don't know the symmetry breaking pattern. So the way these people try to avoid this problem is by actually putting in the large enough quark mass so that you don't have to live with this ambiguity even when the meson mass turns out to be tachyonic. And so the quark mass is supposed to be bigger than the supersymmetry breaking. But then you can take the limit of large supersymmetry breaking without taking also the limit of the quark mass going to infinity, then you can talk about chiral symmetry breaking this way. So it turns out that this is one example where you can turn on the supersymmetry breaking and still say something about the theory, but that doesn't actually tell us anything about what is going to happen for the purpose of discussing chiral symmetry. 
but we also know many examples where you can actually control what would happen to the uh, 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 composite fields when you actually break the symmetry. So if the external symmetries constrain how symmetry breaking patterns enter Lagrangian, for example, like the quark mass in Pyro Lagrangian, we have the QC Lagrangian with quark mass in it. And you can pretend first the quark mass is zero, then you have this SUNF cross SUNF symmetry. And having this finite quark mass can be regarded as in a parameter that transforms under a particular representation under the symmetry group. And of course, that's kind of cheating because the quark mass is a number, it's not something that will transform, but by pretending that quark mass is something that transforms, you can tell how exactly that would enter the Kyra Lagrangian, which is actually a theory of these composite objects, namely meson field, QQ bar, which is described by this unitary matrix. Then you know that, that this quark mass would enter the Lagrangian in a very specific fashion. And that's how I, you can I, make I'm a sorry, prediction I, I on the pion scale mass. Oh, go ahead. Um, I mean, I'll have to back up a little bit because mm -hmm. uh, the n equal to one Susie Young Mills theory mm -hmm. is confining, mm -hmm. right? So, I mean, there must be other confined modes apart from the mesons and variants. Um, so, the, this uh, sort of the result work that originally I've written and Cyborg and many other people uh, actually tell you that uh, this theory is gap. And, and so the, using techniques and supersymmetry, it doesn't tell you exactly what happens to the massive modes of the composites. In this case, only definite predictions you can make is only the structure of the vacua. And in supersymmetric limit, there's actually a discrete set of NC vacua in SUNC gauge theory called the Witten index. And they are degenerate in SUSE limit. But once you actually introduce this finite mass for the gauge genomes, then the degeneracy gets lifted and you end up with a unique ground state. And that's pretty much all you can say about this theory in the presence of the supersymmetry breaking. So you're completely right. Theory is expected to confine. It's supposed to lead to a gap spectrum. But even with the power of supersymmetry, you cannot make precise predictions on a massive spectrum. The only thing you can say is about the vacuum structure. Right. If you can't really talk about meson and baryons, uh -huh. then it will be hard for you to talk about, uh, ab ab about the representations of mesons and baryons. Sure, sure. So that's why you want to talk about theories, which is not pure young mills but having the quark flavors in it. So you, are you going to talk only about uh, the currents and, their, and the current algebra? Is that how you're going I, to? I, no, no, I would actually explicitly talk about meson fields. So the cyborg actually allowed us to compute the potential for the meson fields, even though they are strongly coupled composite objects. And then I go ahead and perturb that result with this anomaly immediate supersymmetry breaking. Yeah, but there could be, uh, there could be with the same quantum numbers, there could be Gagino uh, quark bound states, confined states in the theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they could be. Mm -hmm. And you would have to show that, uh, and they would therefore, since they have the same quantum numbers, they would be in the same multiplet of the super uh, symmetric uh, theory, but they would have to split and you would have to somehow show that that splitting does not involve some discontinuity. Um, so, so what I, I'm going to show is that the cyborg's results are indeed expressed in terms of the mesons and baryons, and including the bound state, the gauge genomes you mentioned, those things do exist, not in SUN, but SON gauge theories. And he worked them all out, as long as they are light, namely nearly massless spectra. He, he can't say anything much about the massive spectrum, but he did come up with exact results for massless spectrum. And that's my starting point. And perturbative with the finite, the, the supersymmetry breaking, and you can study how those massless states would acquire mass and whether they acquire expectation values. So that would be the discussions I'm going to have in a few minutes. Okay, thank you. Okay, so hopefully uh, you, uh, we get to that and then you, uh, you can see what I'm going to say. 
So anyway, so if you have some control by the external symmetry, we already know an example in Cairo Lagrangian that even when you switch from this autoviolet uh, description, namely quarks and gluons, to infrared description in terms of mesons, you know how exactly the symmetry breaking actually appears in that theory. So we borrow this idea on, on the case of breaking supersymmetry. And then special case where we know actually a very good control is the background space time. So just imagine that you are studying QCD in the background of the black hole metric. And you can couple the black hole Schwarzschild metric, the QCD Lagrangian in a well-defined way because of the general coordinate invariance. And when the theory confines and switch to the IR description of Cairo Lagrangian, you still know exactly how this Schwarzschild metric would couple to Cairo Lagrangian, again, because of the general coordinate invariance. So if the symmetry breaking has to do with space time, then we have a very good control on what will happen and in when you switch from the fundamental degrees of freedom to composite degrees of freedom. So it turns out that what anomaly mediation does is exactly that in the case of supersymmetric space time, namely superspace. So there is some field theory which breaks supersymmetry and the potential actually looks like this. So this F, is the order parameter of supersymmetry breaking. And to make sure that the vacuum energy is zero, that's consistent with observed size of the dark energy, which is tiny, you need to cancel this vacuum energy from SUSY breaking by the expectation value of the super potential so that these two balance against each other and they are fine tuned to give you zero. So that's the, 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 the background space time metric. Namely, once your supersymmetry is broken, then your super space is now curved in a way similar to Schwarzschild with a Schwarzschild metric in a black hole background. And so they, through this supergravity theory, the, for example, the Gagino, so the Gravitino acquires a mass because of supersymmetry breaking. So supersymmetry breaking is a breaking of the fermionic symmetry that will lead to massless Goldsteino and massless Goldsteino gets eaten by the gauge field of supersymmetry. That's the Gravitino field and Gravitino acquires a mass, that's the super Higgs mechanism. And if you assume that your gauge theory has no direct interaction with the supersymmetry breaking, namely if they are sequestered, then the only impact of supersymmetry breaking goes through this path, through the curvature of super space time. And it does induce the effect of supersymmetry breaking in a way that's suppressed by the Planck scale relative to this W, that has an, an expectation value. And the size of supersymmetry breaking is controlled by this ratio W of n Planck squared. So all the supersymmetry breaking effects appear based on this one parameter, which I'm going to call little m. And because the impact of supersymmetry breaking only goes through this superspace background, then its impact can be encoded in a way similar to the background space-time metric namely super space-time background. And so this is the analog of square root of minus G in GR. And so this is sort of the Fierbein determinant. And the only impact of supersymmetry breaking appears in the F component of this field epsilon, which is called wild compensator. So you know exactly how supersymmetry breaking effects would enter your gauge theory, which is encoded in this single combination I'm called epsilon. And if the theory is renormalizable with no mass parameters in it, like in massless QCD, then dependence on this epsilon can be fully removed by rescaling the chiral superfields in your theory. So in renormalizable theory, kinetic term is always written as epsilon star epsilon phi star phi, that's the Kähler potential. And in a theory without any mass parameters, the only super potential you can have is phi cubed with this dimensionless coupling. And after you do this rescaling, you can see that you can fully absorb dependence on this epsilon by redefining this chiral superfield phi. So the impact of supersymmetry breaking completely disappears from the theory. But it turns out that this rescaling of the chiral superfield is a one part of the conformal transformation. And we know conformal transformation may not be the symmetry of a quantum quantum field theory because of the regularization of the theory. And so there is actually a conformal anomaly. Hence, we talk about 
anomaly, anomaly mediated supersymmetry breaking. But before going to anomaly mediation, suppose your theory does have mass uh, parameters of mass dimension, like the mass term for some field. Then after this scaling, then supersymmetry breaking doesn't completely disappear because I can only absorb two powers of epsilon into phi, but one power remains. So this one power of epsilon does know about this supersymmetry breaking. So as a result, this superpotential would lead to supersymmetry breaking potential term, which is given by this combination. And, and if you W contains only cubic term, you can see immediately that this uh, combination totally cancels within the parentheses. But if we have the quadratic term or linear term or high order terms, this does not cancel and leads to a tree level results on the supersymmetry breaking. So that's one result we are going to use. On the other hand, if the theory still doesn't have any dimension less full coupling constants, but it still is regulated because of the infinities and you have to renormalize the theory. For example, you then you will have the wave function normalization for the higher superfields. And wave function normalization, it uh, comes with a ratio of the renormalization scale over the cutoff scale M. But as I told you on a previous slide, any dimension full parameter, including the cutoff scale, acquires a supersymmetry breaking effect. And by Cato expanding this, in powers of the theta squared F component, you can see that supersymmetry breaking effects appear because of the derivative of the wave function normalization, namely a normal dimension, and the second derivative and so on and so forth. So that would end up giving you extra SUSY breaking effects. And this is coming from the loop, and therefore this is truly an impact of anomaly of the super conformal transformation. So as a result, you would predict a very specific uh, mass squared for the scalar fields like squawks, which originates from the derivative of the anomalous dimension factor, something called the trilinear interaction, which comes with the wave function normalization anomalous dimension factors. So it's actually very interesting that you get very definite predictions on the way the supersymmetry breaking appear in this series. In particular, this is a very important piece. So when you actually look at this expression, when you want to compute anomalous dimensions, you only need to know physics at the energy scale of interest. If you have integrated out some heavy fields and it doesn't affect your calculation of anomalous dimension, as long as you know the full particle content at that energy scale. And this is the property we call UV insensitivity. Namely, whatever is happening at the large mass scales, it does not affect the prediction on how supersymmetry breaking effects enter your Lagrangian. And same thing is true also with the gauge geno mass. So gauge coupling constant runs as a function of this ratio of renormalization scale over the cutoff scale. Cutoff scale now acquires supersymmetry breaking. If you do the theta expansion up to theta squared power, then this piece in front of this gauge genetic term induces the gauge geno mass, which again is predicted by the beta function of the gauge coupling constant. Namely, the gauge genome mass is predicted to be proportional to the beta function. Again, beta function is the trace anomaly of the, quanta, the, the quantum mechanically broken conformal symmetry. And hence, this is the result of anomaly. And once again, the beta function can be computed by only particle content at the energy scale of your interest. It doesn't matter how heavy particles you have integrated out from your theory. And again, this is UV insensitive. So that's the special thing about anomaly media supersymmetry breaking. You have a definite prediction on the tree level supersymmetry breaking effects that will be sensitive only to dimension four parameters of the theory. And in the absence of dimension four parameters, then you make a prediction on supersymmetry breaking coming only through running effects like the gauge genome mass from running um, uh, gauge coupling constant, scalar mass from anomalous dimension factors, and so on. And once again, I emphasize that this is UV insensitive because these results depend only on physics at that particular energy scale of your interest. And now that sounds actually too good to be true. So I actually went ahead and, and actually did a consistent test of this. So suppose you do integrate out some heavy fields that are coupled to gauge field. 
and you have this prediction of the gauge genome mass, which depends on the beta function. And if you integrate out some heavy particles coupled to the gauge group, your beta function changes. And so there's this continuity in the prediction. It turns out that when you integrate out some heavy quarks, the heavy quark, of course, has a mass. A mass parameter comes with supersymmetry breaking at the tree level in this scheme. So the mass of the quark and squarks are split by finite amount in a very specific way by the supersymmetry breaking. And when you integrate out this heavy quark multiplet, and you do introduce a threshold correction to the gauge genome mass, and this one loop threshold correction turns out to be exactly this discontinuity in beta function above and below the scale of the heavy particle I integrated out. So namely that if you integrate a heavy particle, it gives you threshold correction in such a way that this formula, the gauge genome mass is always proportional to beta function is kept true above or below the threshold. And same is true with the scalar mass squared. Again, it's sensitive only to the enormous dimension factor of the energy of your interest. If you uh, integrate out some heavy particles, enormous dimension factor does change. In this case, you have to go ahead and, and do two loop calculation of this. But once again, we demonstrated that once you integrate out these heavy particles, then you do induce two loop threshold correction to the low energy squawk masses in such a way that this formula, that squawk mass squared is always proportional to the derivative of the enormous dimension factor remains true above and below the threshold of heavy particles. Hence the UV insensitive. These formulae are true at no matter what energy scale you're looking at, only by knowing the physics at that energy scale. And that's the property of UV insensitivity and that's exactly why we think we can apply this method to compute how supersymmetry breaking effects appear even on composite states like mesons and baryons. Now, when you stay at uh, this, Soshi, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I mean, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I got a bit confused at this point. I thought mm -hmm. we showed both us and you guys as well, showed that M3 by two, uh, I mean, dot of M3 by two is not zero, right? In, in the sense that um, if you source the M3 by two uh, because of uh, where the SUSY breaking is happening via you know strong dynamics and you know it has an it has um, some um, renormalization effect, um, uh -huh. so that your uh, your FX for example the primal uh, value for FX actually is scale dependent. So you you do get scaling of M3 by two itself, right? Which uh, no, no, we wrote and you guys also wrote, huh? No, this doesn't run. So this doesn't run. This is sort of like the background metric I mentioned. So, it, so the, if you're worried about a back reaction to yes. the background metric, of course, well, that effect is hugely suppressed by the Planck scale. No, so not, I if, didn't mean that. No, how do you get oh. the M3 by two? You're getting M3 by two by, you want to cancel the three W, right? With the, um, uh, with the full supergravity potential, right? Uh, but the thing is that that's how you get the M3 by two, which is you write as F phi, which is order of FX, but that FX mm -hmm. itself runs, right? Mm -hmm. Right. So as a result of which your your uh, M3 by two, which is FX over M Planck, that also runs. So there is a running effect, no? Uh, so that is true when you have the high dimension operator that connects two sectors. Yeah, but, but how do you generate this M3 by two, right? You generate this M3 by two by having a spontaneous symmetry breaking or some dynamical symmetry breaking in a separate sector, no? In this sector, yes. Yeah, in separate sector, Susie breaking sector piece, no? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. so if, if, it's, if it's a DSB that's generating the Susie breaking sector, so, um, so you, you, the M3 by two changes, right? Uh, I mean, you have a scaling between the M3 by two and the visible sector as well, right? Because of the, the DSB. So if there are operators that are coupled to sectors, yes. yes. But here we are assuming that there isn't. There's no inter direct interaction between the two sectors. So no. if you do the minimal supergravity, then there is actually a coupling between two sectors in a Kata potential. Here assuming there's none. Um, it's, it's, it's right, but I mean, let me remind you this. Uh, so this whole story of more visible effect from hidden mm -hmm. sector, mm -hmm. 
right? You remember that? So th that's yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's the ZX factor comes in, the ZX that scales the FX. And so therefore, yeah, since so FX gets scaled, M3, Y2 gets also scaled. So if the scalar potential of the gauge theory of your interest explicitly depends on, for example, the, uh, uh, the moduli field or SUSY breaking field in a hidden sector, then, then I completely agree with you. Yeah. So, but yeah, but okay. here we are assuming sequestering that there is no such a kind of potential term. Uh, because you assume no? you already you already converted uh, Fy into M three by two theta square. Uh, sorry, yeah, right. You already converted right, but, but uh, the, theta square of S into the, a number. Right, right. But that's the only way two sectors are connected to each other. There is no direct coupling between the two sectors. If you want to write in a supersymmetric, manifestly supersymmetric, you know, one, of, one of the thing would be, I could simply write my phi, the compensator to be an order of F, x dagger x, for example, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So in that way, I could get the, the moment I can turn on the, turn on the x wave, I could turn on mm -hmm. the compensator wave as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Isn't that right? So, yeah, I, so I, I mean, so, I could so think if, both ways. Right, yeah, yeah, but, but, but suddenly, so if you think of, for example, that this is a Poloni, not dynamical Suzy breaking, then, then that's, that's I, I think the point becomes word. obvious. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah. Then. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. So let, let's let's keep it that way then. So let's assume that's Poloni, and then there's no uh, uh, the running effects that would affect Suzy breaking sector, and therefore you can treat this uh, gravity genome mass as a constant. Is that okay? Uh, yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay, so I try to explain this amazing property called the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the UV insensitivity, and I actually once one day I saw an email from Steve, Steven Weinberg in my in my inbox, and he asked me the following question: you Now this formula can't possibly be true. The right hand side of the equation runs because of beta function, and left hand side is mass. And I was baffled by this because, of course, Stephen Weinberg must know that there's something called the running mass in RGE. And I explained, you know, beautifully that way. And, and eventually he became silent. But, you know, this is the way, apparently the way that Stephen Weinberg is. So at the beginning, he seems to ask rather innocuous or even stupid questions. But because he thinks through every problem in quantum field theory himself, at the end of the day, he understands everything better than anybody. So a week later, he started asking me questions about really, really subtle issues about regularization and how things work with that nobody and all that stuff, which I barely managed to answer. But apparently he was happy with my uh, answer at the end, end of the day because he actually even acknowledged me in a preface of the third volume of his quantum theory textbook. So apparently I passed the test. So I was like, phew. But anyway, so uh, this is how you can see even description of this anomaly mediation in his textbook. So all I have to do now is to combine this anomaly mediation to the cyborg's result of SUNCQCD. And in the interest of time, I only to talk about two uh, 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 cases when number of uh, flavors is bigger than NC and when the number of flavors is bigger than NC plus two. In between, there are some special cases, but I'm going to actually skip those discussions. So this is a case, as I mentioned earlier, the theory doesn't seem to resemble QCD at all. In this case, the, the quark fields get bound together in terms of these meson composites. And meson composites have this inverse power potential. And therefore, potential energy gets lowered when the meson field becomes large. And, and hence, the theory doesn't have a ground state. Theory has a runaway behavior. But once you turn on this anomaly with supersymmetry breaking, here is a dimensional full parameter, which is the strong scale of QCD. And because of this dimensional full parameter, the theory picks up the tree level effect of supersymmetry breaking, as I mentioned earlier. So in addition to this supersymmetric potential, which wants to run away all the way to infinity, now we'll have this extra term in the potential coming from supersymmetry breaking little m. And comparing these two terms, your potential now looks like this. In a supersymmetric limit, potential does run away. Theory doesn't have a ground state. Theory goes to actually infinity. But with supersymmetry breaking, it produces a well-defined minimum in between. And it turns out that for infinitesimal supersymmetry breaking, this minimum appears when the meson field is quite a bit greater than the scale of this dynamical scale. And therefore, 
this is the regime where theory is weakly coupled, and hence you can uh, believe this result. Hence, this is an exact result of now non supersymmetric QCD, which shows the meson field condenses in a way proportional to this chronic delta, which breaks SUNF cos SUNF symmetry to SUNF vector, namely proving chiosymmetry breaking from the Lagrangian level. So Cyborg told us that this is the prediction of supersymmetric QCD. What I'm doing is to add the anomaly with the supersymmetric breaking to it. All I had to do is to minimize the potential and that would show that the meson field condenses and leads to this familiar pattern symmetry breaking of the chiral symmetry. Therefore, you have Goldstone bosons, which is basically the imaginary part of this complex meson field. And those uh, 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 non Goldstone bosons, namely pions, also acquire this amino witten term because you have the fermion component of this meson, namely vecinos, which acquire mass, you can compute this, uh, of the order of the supersymmetry breaking. So you can integrate them out. And mesinos actually carry all the anomalies that have to be masked in this theory. Therefore, their loops would induce all the anomalies as needed in this theory. And therefore, that would reproduce this vesemino witten term. So this is the way you can literally derive the chiral Lagrangian of massless Goldstone bosons together with the vesemino witten term starting from the Lagrangian upon infinitesimal supersymmetry rate. And as, Sorry, what, as you expect also- you, What hierarchy did you assume for- Yeah, um, what I'm assuming is that the size of supersymmetry breaking is much smaller compared to the size of the dynamical scale of this QCD. Uh, but, so but, as I said at the very beginning, yeah. with the infinitesimal supersymmetry breaking, I have an exact result. Don't you want to take it now up? Uh, the MC yeah, so I, I come back- the, yeah. Yeah, so I come back and talk about whether this would be continuously connected to non suzy limit after talking about the other case. So please hold on to that discussion just for another minute or so, okay? And you can also see that when the number of flavors is only one, then this meson is just one field, it's not a matrix. So in this case, there is no off-diagonal component to this meson matrix, and therefore there's no number goes to boson. And that's some, something familiar as a U1 problem in QCD, namely you get an Edo prime, which is massive, and there's no massless pion in that theory. So you do re reproduce the result here as well. If you go to large number of flavors, this is the case where you have this very uh, exotic phenomenon that SUN becomes strong, the baryons get bound into bound states, but it turns out that these baryons would break up into smaller pieces called dual quarks. And this is a very exotic phenomenon. Then you also find in magnetic gauge theory, which is weakly coupled, which is now SUNF minus NC gauge theory, which doesn't resemble the original gauge theory at all. And then you have massless meson composites interacting with this massless magnetic quarks. So that's the theory you get as predicted by uh, Nafi Seiberg. And then this interaction between the massless meson and massless magnetic quarks is a dimensionless coupling. So it seems to acquire only loop level anomaly mediation. And if you actually walk through this out, then you do find this loop level, the, uh, the, 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 the anomaly mediated supersymmetry breaking, which seems to go to a wrong symmetry breaking pattern that you don't expect in QCD. But it turns out that this is actually not the right minimum we should be looking at. So in this case, the energy of the minimum is loop suppressed because SUSY breaking effects have been loop suppressed. It turns out that there is actually a direction in field space where this meson field has a full rank expectation value. In that case, the meson wave would actually create a mass term for these magnetic quarks. And then you can integrate out these magnetic quarks in the presence of the wave of the meson field. And when you integrate the, this, these quarks out, the old energy theory becomes pure Young Mills theory, which is known to give you the Gageino condensate, that's the pure supersymmetric Young Mills theory. And the Gageino condensate is represented by this magnetic the superpotential. 
and the super potential depends on the mass of the particles I integrated out, and therefore there is still dependence on the size of the meson field, which now comes together with this dimension four parameter, named the strong scale. So just like in the case of the low number of flavors, we have this supersymmetric potential, but now with this dimension four parameter, that picks up this tree level effect of anomaly mediated supersymmetry breaking. Then potential looks like this. The supersymmetric potential has a high power, which only rises with minimum only at the zero meson field. But this supersymmetry breaking effects would lower the energy in this fashion. So that develops an expectation value for the meson, which is much smaller compared to the size of the dynamical scale. And therefore, this is the weakly coupled limit of the meson field. And therefore, this trust can again be trusted. And given that meson field has an expectation value, it does lead to this familiar symmetry breaking pattern. Once again, that demonstrates the chiral symmetry breaking starting from the QC Lagrangian. And the expectation value and vacuum energy is much deeper compared to the vacuum energy I showed on a previous slide. And therefore, this minimum wins. And I can continue talking about all the other cases in between, but the bottom uh, line is this. For all number of flavors from one to three half NC, you derive chiosymmetry breaking in the presence of infinitesimal supersymmetry breaking. And I will talk about how this might continue on to infinite supersymmetry breaking in the, the two slides, I promise. But before doing so, I'd like to briefly talk about this infrared fixed point behavior. So in supersymmetric limit, Cyborg has already demonstrated for the range of number of flavors between two limits, there is two flow to infrared fixed point where you can have a definite prediction on a conformal weights of the quark and meson fields as a function of their, what is called the R charges. And the beta function also vanishes exactly, you can prove that. And in the limit close to this infrared fixed point, it turns out that the gauge genome mass and scalar masses are all suppressed by power in the energy scales. So in the limit of small renormalization scale, all of these supersymmetry breaking effects would go to zero as a result of this power suppressed behavior. So this is actually immersion supersymmetry. Namely, I have broken supersymmetry explicitly with anomaly mediation to high energies, but all these Susy breaking effects will disappear towards low energies and supersymmetry gets recovered. So that completes the picture with a finite but still infinitesimal supersymmetry breaking. So now comes the question whether I can push size of Susy breaking all the way to infinity without encountering a phase transition. So this is the case I claim, this is still not rock solid, I would think, but you can worry about possible phase transitions. But in the case we studied, the origin of supersymmetry breaking came from the size of the super potential that cancels the cosmological constant in the hidden sector. So this is actually a holomorphic quantity, which doesn't depend on complex conjugates of any parameters or fields. In the same way, the strong scale in supersymmetry gauge theory is a combination of, again, gauge coupling constant and vacuum angle in this particular holomorphic combination. So both the strong scale and supersymmetry breaking are holomorphic. And when you're comparing the size of the SUSY breaking and size of the strong scale, and when you're comparing the sides between them, you have to take the absolute values of them to compare them against each other. But because they are holomorphic quantities defined on their complex planes, you can't draw a circle for the absolute value you may have isolated singularities like poles and zeros, but you can never have a solid circle defined by a holomorphic function of this dynamical scale lambda. So if this is true, then you can always find a path to go from infinitesimal to infinite without crossing any singularities in between, and therefore you expect the phases to be continuously connected. And that's the argument called holomorphy uh, uh, due to originally by Nati Cyberg. And this is a generalization of this now applied to supersymmetry breaking, but because the origin of a normal limited supersymmetry breaking is indeed this holomorphic quantity, namely super potential. So this, uh, the holomorphy argument could well persist. And then you do not expect phase transition on its way 
from infinitesimal Soji breaking to infinite supersymmetry breaking. In, 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 in actually, the way Cyber came up with you know, all these amazing results of supersymmetric gauge theories actually hinged on this argument of holomorphy that the theories are continuously connected by perturbing the theory with the finite mass, you tend to infinity or zero, large coupling, small coupling. No matter how you change parameters, as long as they are holomorphic, there's no phase boundary. And he came up with this comprehensive picture of dynamics of supersymmetric gauge theories. And so I'm hoping the same argument would apply here because again, supersymmetry breaking in this case is a holomorphic quantity. So now I ran out of time. So let me just flash a few results and then would like to conclude. So in the case of SON gauge theories, you have a actually well-defined definition of a uh, uh, the confinement because you have the, uh, the center symmetry of spin n group unscreened by the massless quarks in the vector representation. And Cyber Gouverdy told us that for a particular number of flavors, you actually do have the Coulomb branch like in N equal two theory that actually leads to a massless monopoles. And it turns out that you have two types of singularities. And it turns out that this singularity would have a lower energy once you actually introduce the supersymmetry breaking, because again, of the tree level effect, picking up this dimension of four parameters. And at this singularity, the meson field should have the non-zero determinant, and therefore it breaks the uh, chiral symmetry. At the same time, here you have a monopause, they also carry the flavor quantum numbers that condense, and therefore that leads to the confinement by monopole condensation. So this way, you can see both monopole condensation and chiral breaking happening together in non supersymmetric QCD, and that behavior persists even for lower number of number of flavors by decoupling extra quarks by adding their masses. And that will lead to definite predictions. You can actually test on the lattice. If we have SU2 gauge theory with four number of flavors, that should lead to inferred fixed points. Similarly, for SU3 gauge theories with five, six, seven, eight flavors, SO5 gauge theories with five, six, seven, eight flavors with a monopole condensation with definite confinement with the area law for the Wilson group. So I would be you know, excited to see if you know of any results that actually did the, the, the uh, uh, QCD simulation on these theories. And I will be happy to be proven wrong, but then not knowing the answer. So I would really appreciate your input on that. And I don't have time to talk about this chiral gauge theory, so let me skip them all ahead and then jump to the conclusion slide. So here's the conclusion. And once again, showing this sort of phase diagram, uh, I showed you that the supersymmetric gauge theory had been solved by Cyborg. That doesn't seem to resemble the real world QCD at all, but only with infinitesimal supersymmetry breaking. A normal mediation can be applied to this theory because they are UV insensitive, you know exactly how the composite fields respond to supersymmetry breaking. And you can demonstrate, for example, chiral symmetry breaking all the way up to the number of flavors of three half and C. And I presented the argument that this phase structure would persist by changing the SUSY breaking from infinitesimal all the way to infinity based on holomorphy argument. And that would tell us what universality class non supersymmetric QCD has to be in, which demonstrates the chiral symmetry breaking. So that's my end result. And if you do apply this technique to chiral gauge theories, other people came up with the various conjectures on what kind of mass spectrum they may be, what kind of symmetry gets broken. It turned out that what we got is totally different from the conjectures people made back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And the lesson I seem to be drawing is the gauge theories want to minimize the number of massless fermion composites. And so that's the lesson I am drawing so far. And I didn't have to talk about this, but if you're interested, I'd be happy to show a couple of slides on this. Okay, that's it. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful talk. Uh, maybe we unmute and applaud. Thank you. Um, so, uh, are there? I mean, we had a bit of discussion. Are there any questions or uh, 
if yeah, I, I, have a, oh, okay. I have a question, Shaman. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, um, please. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I, you went over that uh, lattice test very quickly. Could we go back to that? Sure. There we go. And if you could simulate also chiral gauge theories, we also have different predictions on what would happen to the dynamics of those theories. Masses, right. composite uh, so, states, so, and so, symmetry breaking. Right, I saw this and I, what I missed was the uh, quick argument that led to this. So that's what I wanted to fix in my mind. What oh, was okay. the argument? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the argument is really this phase diagram I tried to explain today. And then you have this either fixed point behavior from three half NC in the case of SUN to three NC. This is the case of SONC gauge theories where NC is now corrected to NC minus two. And between these two values, then you expect the infrared fixed point behavior, hence this prediction. So with this many flavors in these gauge theories, I predict that theory would lead to infrared fixed point. Oh, huh. okay. So, I see. It's just the continuity argument which you're using. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, I believe we I might have a, yes. yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I have a suspicion that some of these low numbers of NF may have been ruled out for AC3 gas theory. That would be really interesting to know. So please let me know. Uh, I, uh, yeah, uh, I can explore and yeah. check. Uh, Hitoshi, uh, can I ask a question, yes. Shoman? Please, yeah, uh, Itoshi, your last but one slide where you had this whole diagram, the beautiful you know, uh, diagram of the uh, different this one. Slides. Yeah, so sorry, I'm, I'm being really, really dumb here. Uh, but when you go from um, m equal to zero to m not equal to zero, okay, so from the argument to there. small, yeah, argument from uh, for uh, infinitesimal to getting high, uh, large uh, Susie breaking. That argument mm -hmm. is completely tractable, and uh, you know, uh, the holomorphism is, is, is as good an argument as you probably can get at this particular point. Yep. But going from m equal to zero to m not equal to zero, which mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. has you know, which is equivalent to you know whether you turn on the uh, compensator wave or not, right? Right. That's right. So th how how is there any consistency argument that we say that the uh, theory continuously go? Your ADS potential continuously go, you know, um, from uh, you know f i equal to zero to f i not equal to zero. Right. So, so if we turn off the supersymmetry breaking, mm -hmm. the little m goes to zero, mm -hmm. and meson field goes to infinity, mm -hmm. and that's what you would expect from this potential. Uh, yes. So I get the supersymmetric ADS potential. Yeah, Sorry, that's uh, right. So, that's so super, supersymmetric ADS potential is still there. Yes. And from this ADS potential because lambda is a dimensional four parameter, yes. you get this three level anomaly mediated piece in the scalar potential. Then I minimize the sum and found this minimum with non-zero meson web, which no, no, runs no, the to infinity. Derivation, derivation I clearly understand. Ah, okay, okay, it's sorry. Not, it's not that problem. The problem is that when, when fi is not equal to zero, I can completely buy this potential. There is absolutely uh -huh. no, because there's way too many consistency checks on that potential. Right, right, right. Okay, but when you when I do a theory with f i not equal to zero, mm -hmm. uh, how do I convince myself? You know, I'm, if I'm being skeptic, how do I convince myself that I'm not generating an extra term plus some f i dependent potential? Yeah. So because I'm assuming that this little m is infinitesimal at this stage. Yeah, because so you're saying that theory m is could... continuously connected, right? That is. Yes. It. Yes. Yes. I'm assuming there that, is yeah. no phase transition. When you take f5 to zero to f5 not equal to zero, no, is that and an you assumption? Can see that, or? I would say that's 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 justified after the fact by turning off the Susie breaking. It does recover the supersymmetric theory with the correct runaway behavior, and also for the larger number of flavors, it does recover the result of supersymmetric theory because when you turn off Susie breaking, the meson field gets stuck towards the origin. And that's where the minimum is with this potential. So if I want to write an extra arbitrary polynomial on M3 by two, 
Mm -hmm. right that polynomial also would go to zero in the limit m3 y2 goes to zero um right? well so that you can you can stick in for example the extra k of potential term as a function of meson so yes. the k of potential for meson may not be just canonical you may have m dagger to the fourth power over lambda squared for instance uh, stuff yes. like that yes and and those pieces also get the other uh, has a dimensional full parameter in it and and therefore picks up the supersymmetry breaking effects Mm -hmm. But those effects are suppressed by extra powers of little m over that angle scale lambda. So you're free okay. to add any arbitrary high dimension operators of theory yeah, are so coming from the strong dynamics, but their impacts are always suppressed compared to what I worked out here. So m3 by 2 by lambda. Powers of m3 by That's 2 right, by right, lambda. That's right, 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 right. Okay, but now if you start taking m3 by... Um, Am I missing a chain of thought? So I, if I start taking now M3 by 2 larger and larger, comparable or uh -huh. even bigger than lambda, uh -huh. these effects uh -huh. you still think are, are not, not going to be subdominant, but still track. Uh, no, no, they, they, of... they can be important. And, and that's why you do lose theoretical control. That's why you have to resort to the argument of the continuity. So I can't work out what happens exactly here, for instance. Mm -hmm. But I can expect the universality class is continuous mm -hmm. as long as there is no phase transition. Yeah, okay. And that's why I resort to the holomorphy argument why there's no phase transition in between. So I'm not strong enough to work out the theory exactly when Susie breaking is not infinitesimal relative to the dynamical scale of the theory. I can work it out exactly only in infinitesimal case. But using holomorphy, I can then connect this result for the infinitesimal Susie breaking to the infinite Susie breaking as far as the universality class is concerned. And all the mass of the spectrum will go up and down in between. I cannot predict them, but the vacuum structure is something I hope to predict because of the continuity of phase. Am I making myself clear? Yeah, yeah I, I, I am clear. It's just that I, I, I mean, I probably I have to think about it more. I, I can't be, I'm not, uh, uh, yeah, I can't my, convince myself 100% that, um, mm -hmm. you know, for sure that um, the, the first line, the first line when you go from, when you perturb using AMSB, um, mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, that, you know, things are, um, things that absolutely should be smoothly connected uh, yeah, or, yeah. Or, so, so, or suppressed by, as, as your argument goes, um, yeah. M3 by, so by just, lambda. Just, just again to, uh, I hope that re reinforcing what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So Cyborg told us exact super potential. Yes. We don't ne necessarily know the Kato potential, yes. uh, but it should be some power series in M over dynamical scale lambda. So that's that's what we know. Yeah. And what I'm doing here is to couple that super potential in a Kato potential to a normal immediate supersymmetry breaking uh -huh. to the wild compensator. Yeah. That's all I'm doing. No, I, I, there's I, no ambiguity I, here. No, no, no. I, I completely understand this part, right? The difference okay. what I'm trying to say is that in one case, I have a theta square connected to a mass, uh, a, uh -huh. a, a theta square with a number. Right. The one case I have just epsilon equals to one. Let's mm -hmm. say, you know, th these mm -hmm. are the two different cases, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, and what I'm saying that I, what I can't convince myself is that as I go from epsilon to uh, one to epsilon to one plus theta square delta m, tiny delta mm -hmm. m, Mm -hmm. um uh whether the the theory goes exactly the way uh, we expect it to go like the way you have showed and um, mm -hmm. said it, right but anyway that's my thought process. that's i, I okay. have to figure it to myself a bit so so let okay. me let me kind of continue on this same line by asking right. about that test again okay mm -hmm. so if i take a su2 uh color and four okay. flavors and do not find an infrared fixed point. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly what does that test? Does it invalidate your argument? So the something has to, uh, 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 something is wrong in this line of argument. And there, there is one thing I can see could go wrong. So suppose you have this infrared fixed point behavior in Susie theory. Then you perturb the Susie theory together with the supersymmetry breaking. 
And uh, I went very quickly over there because I didn't have time for it. But what happens here is that the SUSY breaking really does go to zero at low energies, which is a definite prediction. But they, it, there could be some subtlety about this, depending on how quickly SUSY breaking goes to zero. So in, 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 so in terms of this uh, SUSY breaking effect to be, for example, the relevant perturbation, then what you would require that SUSY breaking over the renormalization scale to go to uh, large or zero, which corresponds to relevant versus irrelevant, then the prediction depends on this power. And I cannot predict this power with the technique I have right now. So what could be going wrong in this case is that just by taking the fact that SUSY break itself going to zero, I should not have jumped on a conclusion that IR fixed point theory of SUSY limit would lead to IR fixed point in non SUSY limit. If the SUSY breaking is a relevant perturbation of the system, then RG flow gets deflected. It may flow to something different. And that's where something can go wrong, as far as I can see. Yeah, OK. So that means that you, you really have to perform all the tests that you said. You could yeah, have. That's right. Yeah, you could have one of the theories or even four of those uh, models giving you results which are inconsistent with what you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. want to see. And right. you could still, your, your argument could still be right for right. the rest. So what I, what I do expect is that I, I have done some kind of a large NC analysis. And then the uh, large NC analysis suggests to me that if NC is large, and if you are just above this boundary of three half NC, then the SUSY breaking is actually irrelevant, which is a strong claim because a scalar mass like spoke mass is dimension two, but dimension two operator becomes irrelevant. That's what the large MC analysis suggests. Then if the SUSY fixed point theory would flow to the SUSY fixed point theory. If you go to larger number of flavors, the dynamics becomes weaker and what used to be irrelevant operator turns into relevant operators. And maybe at small NC, you are approaching this top range of the limit more quickly, like for SU2 and SU3 theories. So that's where I can see something can go wrong in my argument for this fixed point behavior. But right now, I do not see anything that can go wrong for the theory below this line of leading to chirosymmetry breaking. At least that's my feeling right now. Thanks. So I'm, I'm brutally honest. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, thanks, Hitoshi, for a nice talk. Just uh, okay. trying to understand, instead of starting with perturbing with a small SUSY breaking, suppose mm -hmm. you had done the opposite with a very large SUSY breaking. So you're on the other okay. side. Then uh, is it uh, clear or obvious that using holomorphy arguments, I can come back to small SUSY breaking or... Uh, well, you should be able to. So to the extent that you buy the holomorphy argument, any finite but infinitesimal SUSY breaking and any finite but large SUSY breaking are continuously connected. Right. So, in so this, you, can, uh, you can worry about the question whether sending M literally to infinity can bring some states from massive to massless. Yeah. So then so, there you have to worry about some kind of discontinuity. So... Uh, your small m or the Suzy breaking parameter m and the dynamical scale lambda, these are both, both holomorphic in supersymmetric theories. Mm -hmm. right? right. Now, right. the way you said that one, one doesn't need to construct, think of a circle, but you have those crosses, the singularities or special points. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, is it, uh, is it possible that the set of these guys is dense enough that I am not able to cross them easily or I go very close to one of them and therefore somewhere the holomorphy argument is slightly modified or needs to be? Well, I don't see how. As long as there is a finite space between the singularities, I can always go through them, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, which way I go shouldn't matter, right? Meaning I could... Yeah, it doesn't matter. You can go back and forth. They are continuous. Okay, thanks. Right.
Okay, so I hope this talk was appropriate for Freemason seminar. So just one question I have. Uh, okay, Sura. When you uh, talk about AMSB, is it also the source for generating slept on masses? Uh, well, so here I'm not applying to the standard model. So I'm not doing uh, like a worrying about the tachyonic slip from mass from a normal mediation. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. So okay. in general, when the theory is asymptotically non-free, which is the case with SU2 gauge part for the uh, MSSM, then you generate negative mass squared. And that's the problem of the negative slip from mass squared in normal mediation. But here, uh, I'm only applying to the, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, asymptotic free theories. So if you go to this IL free range for number of flavors, indeed, the squawks acquire tachyonic mass squared, then this theory is not continuously connected to the non supersymmetric gauge theory because the theory doesn't have a ground state. That's why I specifically did not talk about this IL free phase, which is not connected to non supersymmetric gauge theories. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So thank you once again, Professor Murayama, for a okay. very interesting talk. And uh, thank you for having me. Thanks a lot, Hitoshi. That was a spectacular talk. A spectacular okay, thank topic. you. I mean, this oh, is probably great. one of the biggest results that I have seen in wow. many years. Wow, that's that's amazing comment. I appreciate it. Okay, and okay then yeah. goodbye. And yeah, bye. Thanks.